In this video, I'm going to be doing 50 CISSP practice questions with you, and I'm going to be going through the mindset it takes to pass this exam. I'm Andrew Ramdial. I've been teaching CISSP courses since 2005, 2006 to thousands of students over the many years. And I've always told people this, passing this exam is not just about knowledge. In fact, I've met quite a few folks that have memorized the study guide that knows the material inside out. They go to take the exam and they fail in almost every single domain. This exam is not just about knowledge. I've always told people it's only about 50% knowledge. So if you memorize the book, it's not going to get you over that basically 70% you need to pass this exam. What you need to do is you need to have the mindset. You need to be able to think like a manager. And in this video, I want you guys to learn to develop that thinking. I want you guys to develop that mindset that you need to go in there and pass this exam. So as I go through all the questions with you, I'm gonna be teaching you that mindset. Always keep that in mind. It's not just about knowledge. Just don't pick up the study guide, start studying, and before you know it, you take the test and fail. Pick up the study guide, learn it, but then learn the mindset to pass this exam. Let's get right into it. So we got 50 questions. Now, as I show the questions on the screen, like right now, I want you guys generally pause the video Read it and answer it because I'm just going to read it and answer it right away. I'm not going to pause at any at any point. That's what the pause button is for, right? If I'm too slow, speed me up a little bit. That's fine. But I want you guys to learn the mindset of it. And I'm going to give you guys a lot of tips as I go through every single one of these questions. So it's going to be a pretty long video. Let's get right into it. All right. Practice question number one. In the context of disaster recovery planning, what is the most critical aspect to consider when creating a recovery time objective. A, the cost of implementing disaster recovery measures, the availability of backup data, the criticality of business functions, the geographical location of the disaster recovery site. Now, one of the things that we find in the CISSP exam is you're going to get quite a lot of questions like this where most of the choices, if not all the choices, are absolutely correct. You're going to have this one where it's most now, I'm going to give you guys a tip that I've given all my students that has helped them on tons of practice questions. Anytime you guys get a question where you see something like most, that tells me something, that all of these choices, if not at least two, will be absolutely correct. So when you're thinking about something that's most critical aspect, you know, for some companies, it may be the cost. For some companies, it may be, well, is there backup data available? For some companies, be how critical is that business function? And then, hey, where exactly are those disaster recovery sites? So we got a great question here, four choices. Let's see what the answer is on this one. This is going to be C. Now, why is that? Well, when you come to a question and you have, and, and this is going to be a mindset that I'm going to teach you throughout these questions. When you come to a question where you have choices that are all correct, here's a quick tip. Here's the mindset. Go with the broadest one. Go with the choice that includes all the other choices. For example, this answer, the how critical a business function, the criticality of business functions, this here will tell us some, generally something that's very critical will dictate the cost. So it includes A, right? It'll dictate how it should be backed up and when, you know, where the availability should be. The geographical location recovery site, this one here was more of a throughout answer. Yes, it shouldn't be close to your actual data centers, but in this one here, we're looking at how fast we can bring things up. Don't forget, the recovery time objective specifies the maximum allowable downtime for a critical business function. So when you're thinking about a particular question, the criticality of business function, this here will then dictate maybe how much we should be spending on backing that thing up. Something that's super critical will generally require a lot of money to maybe you have multiple backups across multiple sites. Maybe you have it in cloud and physical locations in one. All right, good question. Remember the tip. If one choice is including all the other choices or one choice includes multiple choices, that's generally a good answer uh, for that particular question. One of the things about the CISSP is thinking like a manager. Quick tip. When you think like a manager, you don't think specific. You think overview. Managers don't see one thing. A tech does. Technical people, if they work on a firewall, they fix, fire, they fix firewalls. Managers, 
They don't see just firewalls. They see the entire system. So this is something we have to think about. We think of business functions. We think of keeping our business running. We think of keeping it cost effective. Great tips there. All right, practice question number two. Now, this is going to be a straight up knowledge question. This is a question if you have the knowledge, you're going to get it right. If not, you're going to be kind of messed up here. So which of the following security models is most likely to be used in a highly classified government agency where data confidentiality is of utmost important? The BIBA or BIBA model, Bell Lapadula or Lapadula, depending on how you want to pronounce that, Clark Wilson, De Brewer Nash model. Let's go into this. So in this particular one, the Bell model is the model of confidentiality. Now notice they say data confidentiality. Bell model basically has a set of rules and it comes with the principles of no read up, no write down. All right, so no read up, no write down. What this does is it ensures that folks at a lower level Maybe somebody with secret cannot read top secret data. And no write down. Folks with top secret can't write to a secret. Why is that? Because what they're saying here is that someone who has a top secret clearance can't take top secret data, copy it, and then put it into secret documents or public documents. So these are the rules of confidentiality. Now, once again, this question is mostly knowledge-based. If you knew your, your models, you probably would have gotten this one correct. The rest of these are basically integrity model. I'm not going to get into this here because it's not a training course, but when we in the course, we'll cover all the different models that are out there, such as the Bible model and what there and what that model rules is for integrity. Make sure you know these models for your exam. Practice question number three, another knowledge one. Which cryptographic algorithm is best suited for ensuring the integrity of large files or messages. So this one, you need to know your algorithms before going into your exam room. Know what algorithms are symmetric, know, know the pros and cons of symmetric, asymmetric, and integrity. So in this particular one, the only integrity algorithm that I have here is going to be SHA-256, which is a pretty standard integrity algorithm that we use in today's world. In fact, most things that utilizes a cryptographic hash is going to be SHA-256. Don't forget SHA comes, this is SHA-2, there's a SHA-3. They come a variety of sizes from 128, 256, uh, 384, 512. So there's different variety of sizes, but 256 seems to be the standard one. RSA is an asymmetric algorithm. AES is a symmetric algorithm. If not, these are going to be the two most famous symmetric and asymmetric. DES is depreciated. You should not be using DES. DES has been cracked because of its smaller key size at 56 bit. That is a symmetric algorithm also. All right, practice question number four. In the context of network security, which of the following protocol is least likely to be used for security transmitting sensitive data? Before taking your exam, know your protocols. Know which ones is you should be using in the world of security and which ones you should not be. Okay, we are all pretty much familiar with HTTPS as HTTPS is secured with SSL, so that's good. SSH is, this is the secure shell. This is your secure version of Telnet, so that is secure. SNMP does include encryption now. This is a simple network management protocol. This is used to manage network components, gather statistics about network components. FTP is insecure. FTP is not sensitive, all right? Now, I want you guys to notice this word lease. On your exam, be prepared for tons of questions where you have lease, most. Uh, you're also going to have things where you have to choose things that are not like this. Which one of these is not going to be the best answer? So be prepared for a lot of questions. If not all of them, basically comes like this. Okay, don't forget to know your algorithms before going into your test. Practice question number five. Let's take a look. Which of the following is the most critical consideration when designing a disaster recovery plan for a data center? A, redundant power providers. B, knowledge of geographic disasters. C, geographic location of, of the backup data center. And D, backup of a disaster recovery plan. Now, this is a good question. Basically, when you're making a disaster recovery plan, you know, what are you thinking about? What goes through your mind? And all of these pretty much sounds good. D, for example, should you back up your plan? Yes, you should. You should know where the disaster, where your backup data center is. 
you should know all the geographic disasters where your backup data center is going to be, such as is the disaster site, I'm sorry, is the backup site prone to earthquakes, hurricanes, and can you get multiple pro power providers coming in to a data center? Now, let's go through this. So the best answer here is going to be C, and here's why. I gave you guys a tip earlier. If one choice is doing multiple of those choices, it's probably going to be the correct answer. Always go with that broader answer and say to yourself, well, what choice here includes all the others? For example, the location of a data center can dictate, can you get redundant power coming into it? The location of a data center or a backup data center, in other words, determines what type of disaster it's prone to. Some data centers may be prone to earthquakes, while some are not. For example, you put one in San Francisco or California versus putting one in the middle of the country where they might not get earthquakes, but they may get tornadoes and hurricanes on the coast and so on. A uh, backup of a disaster recovery plan. While this is important, you have to say which one is more important. Like, which one are you going to go with over one over the other? I'll give you guys a quick tip. When you're doing your CISSP exam, I want you guys to say this to yourself. You're looking at the question. In real life, because this test is definitely not real life, in real life, you can go with multiple things. In real life, we're not going to go with one option, right? In real life, we don't go with one. In real life, we do everything here. But you have to choose one option. And the tip I tell people is, if in real life, think about this in a real life, if in real life, you can only do one thing, one thing and one thing only, what would it be? If you go with this, you can't go with that in real life. Like, which one is the most critical one? Because if you think about it, the geographic location would be more important. Like where you put, like if I said you can choose the right location or just back up your plan, which one would you go with? You back up your plan and forget the location? No, right? That's why C is a better answer here. Okay. That's why you got to focus yourself on one and one choice only. All right. Next question. In a cloud computing environment, which of the following is the most critical factor for ensuring data security and privacy? Services provided by the cloud provider, strong, strong access control and authentication, regular security audits and assessment, service level agreements with the provider. Okay, this one also has multiple correct answers. Why? Look at this. We got this word most here. Now, I'm going to eliminate two choices. First of all, the SLAs are mostly going to be for things like the performance the, S, the performance of the service provider, like uptime and downtime. Somebody eliminate that one. Services provided by the cloud provider. You know, AWS offers quite a lot of services from web services, data backups, and so on. I don't think that's really going to look so much so to data security. Now we come down to two things. Now you have to focus yourself. You have to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to use a cloud provider. Now in real life, once again, we're going to have both. You know, you're going to want to think about, is it a secure authentication? And is these data centers being checked? Things like SOC reports and so on. You know, which one are we going to go with? And now you really got to narrow it down. Now, if you're going to have one thing and one thing only, remember that's this tip I gave you. If you can choose one of those choices and no more, like if you can only go with one, would you want regular security audits and no authentication? Or would you want great authentication or forget the security audits? This is how you have to think, all right? This is the mindset. If you go with one, forget the other one. You're not going to get it. You can only get one. Which one would it be? Would you guys want authentication? Would you guys want security audits? Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go with a cloud provider, I think if I can only have one, I'm going to go with that strong authentication. I want good authentication in directly impacts the data security. And especially the word privacy gives this away because Access controls controls the access between subjects and objects. Access control controls things like Bob can access that file, Mary can write to that file, Bob can only read to it, and so on and so on. So B is the best answer. Now remember this tip. If you can do one, you gotta forget the rest. And that gives you this here. Plus, if you read very carefully, one of the one of the main reasons that people don't get questions correctly on this exam is they read it too quick. They have to read directly into the question and answer as they give as they get the question. Practice question number seven. 
Which of the following cryptographic techniques does cryptographic shredding predominantly depend on? So this is called crypto shredding, symmetric, asymmetric, hash, or steganography. Now for this one here, if you understood what crypto shredding is, it is a pretty easy question as most crypto shredding is done with symmetric encryption. So what exactly is crypto shredding? So crypto shredding is basically used in the cloud. What crypto shredding does is that in order to delete cloud data, Right? You can't go and wipe physically wipe out the hard drives of an AWS server. But what you could do is you can encrypt the data with a key on your machine, symmetric key. Now, remember the thing with symmetric encryption. The key that encrypts is the same key that decrypts. So if I encrypt data in the cloud with a key, store the key on this machine right here, and then I delete this key permanently, this key is gone forever. There's no way to decrypt that data in the cloud because the key that encrypted the data has is gone. That is is crypto shredded. Now, where is it, you know, what type of key does it use? It doesn't use an asymmetric key. That's two keys, public and private keys. A hash really doesn't encrypt data, it just produces a cryptographic hash. Steganography is basically hiding data in data, basically hiding like a message inside of a picture. It does not use that function. This here is a knowledge-based question. Quite a lot of my students get questions on crypto shredding. Make sure to know it for your exam once again. Practice question number eight. In the context of security incident response, which of the following is the most important consideration when determining the severity of an incident? The number of system affected. Okay, I like that answer. The financial impact, definitely. The level of media attention, depending on the company, sure. The potential harm to the organization's reputation. Sure. Okay. You got to think like a manager here. You got to say to yourself, if I'm the boss, which one would I be worried about the most? The number of system being affected. Yes. This is going to bring it down. Yes. You can lose money. Yes. The media is going to come after you. The potential harm. But there's one thing here that stands out the most. There's one that if you know, that takes over all the answers. Remember this tip, if one choice does the does the others, then that's the answer, watch. The number of systems going down affects how much money we make. If we get negative media attention, we lose money. The potential harm to the organization, again, we lose money. Like which one of these choices is gonna lead to the other, to the main, to the, to the main choice? It's like, the financial impact is the end goal, right? The financial impact is what happens at the end, not what happens throughout. See it as a manager. Manager sees to the end of the tunnel. The text is who see throughout the tunnel. So this is the end thing that happens. Of course, if you were thinking like a manager, you would have said, well, money is involved. So that's probably the answer. Anytime you take your exam and you see a choice that talks about money being involved, it's probably a good option. It may not be the correct option, but it's a good option to keep, to keep an eye on. Practice question number nine. Which of the following is the most critical step in the secure SDLC or software development for preventing, keyword preventing security vulnerabilities? Penetration testing, code review, requirements gathering, user acceptance tested. This one here, you really have to think. Now, when you think about preventing security vulnerabilities, what can we do? The word prevention means to go back, right? So you're preventing heart disease by exercising and eating right now. You don't prevent heart disease after you get it, right? So you don't prevent vulnerabilities by cleaning up a virus. That means you got the virus, you never prevented it. So anything to do with testing is eliminated because testing comes after the fact, right? Testing is something we're going to, like if you're testing for heart disease, right? That means that you probably are seeing maybe if you have it, that means you haven't really prevented it, right? So if you're testing to see if there's bugs means, hey, you didn't prevent the bugs. You can test to see if there's bugs in there though. If you're, you can test to see if your prevention method worked, but you're not preventing him. Review is another word. If you're reviewing something, that means that you're checking to see if your prevention method works. The best way to prevent things is to collect the requirements correctly. What requirements are we needed to prevent 
a particular security bugs. Maybe we need particular coding standards or particular methods of coding that software, or we can prevent vulnerabilities by using, again, in requirements, you would list one of the requirements is using the latest in security protocols, for example. So remember this word prevent, read carefully. If you got this one wrong, you weren't reading carefully. Question 10. In the context of security governance, what is the primary role of a steering committee? Developing technical security controls, managing day-to-day -day security operations, setting strategic security objectives and priorities, conducting security risk assessment. Now, a couple of things here. This is a question about management. A steering committee is a committee that, quote unquote, steers to determine direction, to determine where are we going. Like, for example, a security steering committee is going to set all those high level policies within the organizations, what we should be doing now and, of course, in the future. So, when you think of a manager's job, does a manager deal with the day to day work? Do they deal with the day, especially a steering committee, right? They determine futuristic things, they don't determine the day to day things. You may have a day-to-day -day operations manager, but when it comes to a steering committee, they're not going to be doing the day-to-day -day operational tasks. Managers, let's be realistic, are not very smart in terms of technical things. In fact, managers depends on a technical team to give them a lot of technical directions. So that would eliminate developing technical security controls. Steering committees don't do that. Maybe they work with the technical team to do that. Conducting risk assessments, that's something more like a security manager should do, not necessarily a steering committee. A steering committee, again, is very high level. They determine high level future tasks that we should be doing. So nothing in particular, bringing the answer to C. Steering committees in particular, such as a security steering committee within an organization, will develop the security objectives and strategic. Strategic means long term. Strategic plans, for example, are about three to five years. And what we should be prioritizing, this is going to be more of what a manager, a team of management should be doing. All right, practice question number 11. Oops. In a distributed denial of service attack mitigation strategy, what is the most important goal during the detection and response phase? All right, detection and response phase. Identifying the source of the attack, mitigating the attack and restoring service, collecting evidence for legal prosecution, blocking the traffic from a known IP address. So this one, you really have to read into it. So it says detection and response. So you have to detect it and you have to respond to a DDoS attack. What's a DDoS attack? It's when you have a ton of bots coming after your website, generating a ton of traffic, maybe bring the website offline. Identifying the source of attack. That sounds good. Mitigating and restoring service, well, that's good because that's how you should respond. Collecting evidence for legal prosecution is going to come way after this. Blocking traffic for not knowing, this area is going to help to slow or stop it. So we don't want this. Identifying the source of attack, although that's good in detection, which one here was better? So I got A and B. Now notice the goal, the key word. Now, if you guys selected... Um, a, right, if you guys selected A, you're going with what you're doing. You're not going with the goal of what exactly is the goal of detect and response. Did you get that? The goal of detecting an attack and responding to it is to stop the attack, right, mitigate the attack, slow it down, and restore services. That is the goal of what we're trying to do. In doing that, you will identify the source of attack. You may block traffic from no one IP, but that is what you're doing. That is not the goal of it. My goal is to lose weight. I want to lose 10 pounds, okay? But me jumping on a treadmill is not a goal. The goal is to lose the weight. The activity of jumping on a treadmill will lead to my goal. The CISSP exam is worded. Very uniquely, you have to pay attention to the words. If you guys got this question wrong, because you didn't read correctly, read the question clearly. Hopefully, as you go through these 50 questions, you're going to see it. Okay, I need to start reading these questions more carefully. And you're going to see the answer is, you know, the answer is not that difficult if you read them more carefully. 
Practice question number 12. Which of the following controls is most effective in preventing a privilege escalation attack? Role-based access control, network intrusion detection system, antivirus software, security information, and event management. Okay, pretty easy question if you understood what it is. So it's a privilege escalation. Privilege escalations is when I log in as a normal user and I do something to the machine to boost my privilege to become an administrator. Now, a couple of things here that I can eliminate right off the bat. First of all, a network intrusion detection system. That's not going to help you here because this here detects intrusions on a network. This here detects intrusions uh, coming through your entire network. So maybe like a worm or something like that spreading on a network. Privilege escalations attack generally happens on a single system. I see this here can detect events. This is a correlation of logs. Think like Splunk. So this here is not going to be preventing it, but this can detect it. And some people may say, well, Andrew, well, maybe an IDS can detect a worm that's going to do a privilege escalation. But once again, the word is prevent. This is detect. Antivirus software versus role-based access control. Now, I do like these two answers. These are great answers because 99% of the time, guys, for them to do a privilege escalation attack, they're probably going to use some kind of malware. So in that case, C is a good answer. But then you have A, role-based access control. Now you got to come back to the mindset I told you. You can only do one thing. If you do A, you're not doing C. So if you do A, in other words, you limit the guy's permission versus C, you install antivirus. So if you're doing one, you're not doing the other. So remember this choice. If you do one, you're not doing the other. That's how you got to see this. If I'm doing this, I ain't doing that one. In real life, yes, I know you'll have antivirus and you'll have restricted user accounts because role-based access control is basically putting people into groups and assigning permissions. So which one would I go with? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to go with role-based access control. Here's why. Role-based access control literally is limiting people to a particular role. Like if you work in accounting, you can only do accounting duties. You're a normal user on this machine and you can access these accounting files. Antivirus. If you just install antivirus, but you give them full access to the network, great. But that means that if they use a privilege escalation software that's not considered as a virus or a zero-day exploit, they're going to get through. But if they didn't even have permission in the first place, the system would have limited them, in other words, to just those particular tasks, making this a better, a better answer than just that. So again, use this thing where I'm telling you if you're doing one choice, you're not doing the other. In other words, you can only do this. And everything else you will not be doing. Because again, in real life, guys, we are going to be doing everything. Yeah, I know we're going to do everything. But for this exam, we can only do one. Question 13. In the context of security risk management, which of the following risk th treatment options is the most appropriate for risks that are outside the organization's risk appetite? Risk avoidance. Tolerance, acceptance, or mitigation. So we have to know our risk responses here. So the first thing up, we have to decode, you know, what exactly are they asking for? So when something is outside your appetite, it means you don't want it to happen. Risk appetite is how much risk you're willing to take. So if you have no appetite for the risk, the only thing here you can do is elimination. Wipe out the risk. So the risk will not happen. Which one of these responses is going to tell you that, you know, which one of these responses is going to tell you that it's going to eliminate risk? Now, if you know your risk responses, it's pretty easy. So, for example, you should ex automatically eliminate acceptance because acceptance means to do nothing. It's when you take no action against a risk, and if it happens, it happens. It means you're willing to accept it. You know, you have a big appetite for it. Risk transference, the risk can still take place. It's just that somebody else has to deal with it. Generally, like hiring an insurance company. Risk mitigation and avoidance. This is the one that confuses people. Mitigation is lowering. All right? This lowers a risk. Risk mitigation lowers probability and or impact. For example, installing an antivirus. You can still get virus on the computer, but it's, it's a lower probability and or impact of a virus hitting your machine. But risk avoidance is the elimination of risk. Risk avoidance eliminates risk. Remember that. It's an action you take to eliminate risk. For example, uh, 
I don't have the risk appetite for virus A on a Windows server. How do you eliminate virus A? Don't use Windows. If you don't use Windows and virus A only affects Windows, then you know what? You'll never get virus A. Then move to a Linux server. That eliminates virus A. But you know, you guys gotta remember something, you know, just to make this a little complex here for you guys. Every action has risk. Every single action we do in life has risk. So by eliminating one risk, you may get another risk. But and you know that word is gone. That risk is gone because that risk is completely eliminated. Practice question number 14. Which of the following security controls is most effective in preventing the execution of malicious code from an untrusted source? Now, keep in mind the word preventing. Intrusion prevention systems, antivirus software, application whitelisting, host-based firewalls. So these are all good. Now, once again, in real life, you're going to have all these things. In real life, you're going to have an IPS installed with an antivirus, installed with a host-based detection system. In fact, every time you install a lot of these endpoint security software, you're going to have all those. So you install Semantics Endpoint Security or McAfee, whatever that you're using. They come generally with some kind of IPS, malware detection, and some kind of firewall. So which one here would you go with? Well, let's start out. It says from untrusted sources. How can we stop people from execution of malicious code from untrusted sources? Which one am I going to eliminate first? I'm going to go with a whole space firewall. A firewall blocks traffic coming into the system. But if the user goes out and grabs the traffic and clicks on the file and says to download, it's not the firewall is not going to stop it. I'll eliminate that one. Intrusion prevention systems. This here stops malicious traffic from coming into the system, but what if the user initiated that? Not going to help. Antivirus now comes down to two things. Antivirus and whitelist them. So what exactly is application whitelisting? Application whitelisting, whitelisting is when you say you can install only those software. And blacklisting is when you say you cannot install these software. Blacklisting is very broad because if you blacklist 10 applications, then they can install every other application on the planet. But if you whitelist 10 applications, that's all they can install. Let me ask you guys a question. Which one would you guys go with? Whitelist, in other words, you can only install these five software. Or you can install anything you want, but I'm putting the antivirus. Which one would you go with? Again, if you're doing one, you're not doing the other. All right, that's how you got to see this. Are you doing one? If you do this one, you're not doing this one. Which one would you guys go with? I'll tell you which one I'll go with. I'm going to go with the whitelisting. Here's why. Because with the whitelisting, I'm saying you can only install these five software and nothing else will ever be executable on this machine. Versus an antivirus, then you can install whatever you want. That's how you get this one, making C a better answer than B. Are you guys getting this mindset? All right, are you guys seeing how I'm seeing it? You see it like this, the CISP? Not too difficult, right? Practice question 15. In the context of cryptography, which of the following statement about the birthday attack is true? It's a type of cryptographic attack that targets weak encryption algorithms. It's a collision attack that occurs when two different inputs produces the same hash value. It's a form of side channel attack that exploits the physical characteristics of a cryptographic device. It's an attack on the birthday paradox to compromise encryption keys. Now, this one here does have a few good answers, but one of them is the absolute true answer, more true than others. So first of all, let's eliminate the absolute wrong one. It has really nothing to do with the physical characteristics of any cryptographic uh, devices, and it's not considered side channel attack. Now, it does it does play off of what's called the birthday paradox. And the birthday paradox is when you put a certain number of people in a room, there's a high probability that two people have the exact same birthday. It does play off of that birthday paradox. It is, it's a type of cryptograph that, that targets weak encryption. We don't want to say weak encryption algorithms, so I'm going to eliminate this because technically the algorithms are not weak. It's just that they didn't have a high enough bit strength. So, you have, it comes down to B and D here, and we got to understand what exactly is it. Now, by its definition, it really is a collision attack when two different inputs produces the same hash output. So that basically is its definition. This uses the birthday, par the birthday paradox, but there's no keys in, 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 uh, in hashing. 
Hashing doesn't utilize keys. Hashing takes data of uh, basically any length, hashes it, and produces a cryptographic hash. It doesn't, it's not a key, it's a function. The output, that 128-bit, 256-bit hash, is not a key. That's just a hash value. What exactly is the birthday paradox? Quick, quick lesson on this. By definition, hashing takes data of any length and any kind of data, and outputs technically should be a unique hash. The problem is you have unlimited inputs. In other words, you can put unlimited amount on or types of data, and it's going to output, let's say, a 256 bit hash, but there's only a certain number of 256 bit hashes, which is how many hashes? Well, 2 to the 256, a very big number. So the probability of having different messages with the exact same hash exists, but how high is that probability? Well, let's say, let's say that I told you that this algorithm can only produce 10 hashes. Well, then there's a high probability that different messages are going to produce the same hash because you only have 10 probable hashes. But when the number is 2 to the 256, it's very unlikely. You see, the birthday attack is when, is when you have two different messages with the exact same hash. So if you only had 10 hashes probable, let's say your algorithm only produced 10 hash, it's a high probability of having a birthday attack. Where does this affect you? What exactly is hashed a lot? Passwords or hash, right? No password is ever stored in clear text, or it shouldn't be. It should be stored as a hash. With the birthday attack and affect the system is when, let's say your password is car, C-A-R, and I come to your computer and I type van and logs me in, S-U. What happened here? The word car and the word van is producing the same cryptographic hash. Generally, the more hashes you have, like 256 bit, it's very unlikely but it's not impossible. And that's the definition of a birthday attack. Join me in the course and we'll go more into cryptography if you want to learn more about that. Let's go to number 16. Which of the following is the primary goal of a security awareness training program within an organization? To ensure all employees can effectively respond to security incidents, to reduce the likelihood of insider threats and data breaches, to achieve compliance with industry standards, to teach employee the organization security expectations. Now, this is a question of the word primary and the word goal. You have to read it carefully. What answer did you get? Well, you're looking at the endpoint. Remember, anytime you see the word goal, you're looking at the endpoint. When you see this word primary, you know most of those choices are correct. Like when you're doing security awareness training, you're gonna teach them what what you expect them to do. You're going to teach them how to respond to security incident. You're going to achieve compliance with industry standards because that's one of the reasons why you would do it. But what exactly is the goal? Well, the goal here is really to reduce data breaches. Why do we do this? What is the end point? Remember, let me see this word goal. Think of, well, we know what exactly is the main reason? Not doing it. Doing it is the act of doing the actual action, the act of doing it. But the goal is what you want out of it. Now, let me show you how all of this links up. Look, to teach employees the security expectations will reduce the likelihood of insider threats. To ensure all employees respond effectively will reduce employer threats. Now comes B and C, which a lot of you guys probably went with C. But... Why, uh, why do we have laws and regulations? Why do we follow these certain compliance? Not just to be in compliance, but those compliance, those laws and regulations that why we should have security awareness training is really to reduce the likelihood of threats and, and uh, data breaches. So I want you guys to remember, look at the end goal. Look at where exactly are we going with this. Best answer. Number 17. In the context of cloud computing, what is the primary concern when it comes to data security and compliance? Now, the word here is compliance. You know, when it comes to primary concern with data compliance, data encryption during transmission, sounds good. Physical security data center, that sounds good. Data sovereignty. So data sovereignty, this affects the jurisdiction of the data. Where is the data created, where the data is stored, and the laws that applies to it. For example, Data collected in the EU, because the data was the data collects there and it's EU citizens' data, has to have EU laws applied to it and legal jurisdiction. Multi factor authentication for cloud users. I like this because it's a cloud. This is a good question because when you're managing the cloud, you want everything. You want data encryption during transmission, 
You want physical security. You want to worry about laws. You want to worry about, hey, you got to make sure that hackers can't get in to use multi-factor. Now, which one is going to be a primary one? The primary one. Once you get a question like this, which one affects all the others? Well, let me tell you guys something. The data sovereignty and the jurisdiction will affect the encryption we use, will affect how the data centers are secure, and will affect the type of authentication. This is one where you use that mindset. If one choice can include all the other choices, then that is the primary thing. Ideally, you're, you think about this. What's your primary concern? Your primary concern is all of these things. So which one here is all? That's the mindset. Which one is all? Go with that one. Practice question number 18. Which of the following encryption algorithm is considered the least computatively efficient but provides the highest level of security? AES, RSA, ECC, and Blowfish. So which one here is not very good at computing? Which one is really slow in other words? Notice this word, least. Now, if you know, if you know the difference between symmetric, asymmetric, hashing, and so on, this is a pretty easy one. Because if you remember in your teaching and your learning, Symmetric encryption is very quick, but passing a key is difficult. Versus asymmetric, asymmetric is very computationally intensive, but it's easy to pass the keys around. So that means RSA is the answer here because RSA is the only asymmetric. This is a symmetric. Actually, ECC is a symmetric, but ECC uses a smaller key size than RSA. ECC is very, really not too bad when it comes to computation because it actually uses a small key size versus RSA. Uh, so this one no good, this one no good, and Blowfish is a, is a symmetric algorithm. So once you know symmetric, you should have eliminated A and D. And then it was like RSA and ECC. Remember for your exam, RSA requires a bigger key size than ECC or the elliptic curve, which requires a smaller key size. Make an RSA, not the best when it comes to computation. For example, an RSA key may be 2048 bit versus an ECC may be 384 or 256. Question number 19. Okay, um, I don't have a lot of questions on SOC reports, but please, no SOC. SOC reports is on everybody's CISSP exam. SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3, and then type 1, type 2 reports. Make sure you know the difference for your tests. A vendor provides you with a SOC 2, type 2 report. What statement most accurately interprets this report? The vendor system controls are properly designed. The vendor has achieved a certain level of compliance with a recognized standard. The vendor system controls has been audited over a specific period of time or found to be operated efficiently. The vendor has no security vulnerabilities. Now, almost all of these answers are correct, but one is more correct than the others. Here is why. First of all, a SOC report does tell you the controls, if they're good. It does tell you it may tell you if it's recognizable by a standard. But by looking at the report, you can see if it is or is not. Then there's no security. Okay, whoever's doing the audit, I like that. But you know what's better? A SOC 2 report is done over a period of time. A SOC 2 report is generally done over a period of 6 to 12 months. So you would see that on a SOC 2 report, they'll say, well, between this time and this time, we audited the systems, and the system came back to be good or bad. Now remember, a SOC 3, a SOC, uh, type 3 report is basically the same thing, except it's more of a high-level, publicly available summary of it. Make sure to know this topic for your test. Question 20. Which of the following is the primary purpose of a security policy within an organization? To specify detailed technical configuration for, for security controls, to outline the roles and responsibility of security personnel, provide high-level guidance and direction for security efforts, to define specific incidents and a response procedure. Know for your exam, policy. So you have policy, standards, guidelines, right? And then you have your step-by-step -step procedures. So it's not something that's very technical. A policy is a much more of a high-level thing. Now, this is going to be straight out of your books. Any book you read should tell you this. Now, to specify detailed configuration for security, that's going to be more of a procedure. To outline, this is going to be more of like a racy chart, something that shows roles and responsibilities, not so, not so much on a policy. To define specific, this is more of an incident response. Literally, it says the word procedure, so you should eliminate that. Now, 
Remember for your exam, policies are directives from management. Where does policy come from? Management gets policies from industry standards and property regulations that they have to follow. So management sets the direction of the organization's security with their policies. And remember something. If management is right in the policy, what do you know about it? It's not going to be technical because they're not. It's not going to be super detailed because they generally don't have time to sit there and write detailed stuff. So it's going to be more high level, but it's going to set the direction of where we're going. Question 21. In a security incident response plan, what is the primary purpose of a post-incident review? So we got this word primary again. And then the, you know, the purpose of it. The purpose. Like what's the end goal here? Identifying and prosecuting the attacker is responsible. Okay. Assessing the effectiveness of response and identifying errors and improvement. Okay. Communicating the incident to external parties such as customer and media. Okay. Restoring effective systems and restore services to normal. Now, notice this is the post-incident review. So what's a post-incident review? Is after the incident has happened, you're reviewing what happened and what you did right, what you did wrong. This here is going to be straight up for process of improvement. Like, why would you review? Post means after. Why would you review after the incident? It's during the mitigation of the incident, responding to the incident, are you going to try to identify the attackers? So that's not right. It's during that that you may have to uh, communicate to customers that their data was lost. It's during the response to the incident that you're going to restore system. Post comes after. So read the question carefully to get this one right. Take away from this, read your questions carefully if you didn't get that one right. Which of the following security control is most effective in preventing a malware inf uh, infections from malicious email attachment, prevention systems, content filtering, host-based firewall, and patch management. Now, how can we prevent? So prevent is not a detection, right? Prevention stops things before they even occur. Like, how can we not even get it onto the machine? Well, host-based firewall can generally stop things trying to enter the machine, but if the user initiated, especially like on, a, uh, like on an email, and somebody double-clicks it and just starts downloading it, it'll come. Patch management can stop it from being installed, but it wouldn't stop the things from getting to the machine. An IPS can prevent the, the virus from getting in to the machine if the virus is circulating around the network. And it doesn't say whether it's a whole space one or it's a network one. So the best thing, how do we really stop the virus from even getting to the, to the user's inbox? Just use a content filtering. The key word here is preventing. So you got to read that one carefully. Question 23. In the context of security code in practice, which of the following actions is most important for preventing common vulnerabilities like SQL injection and cross-site scripting? Implementing input validation and output encoding using the latest programming language, regularly scanning for application, encrypting sensitive data in transit. Okay. First of all, I can eliminate one answer right off the bat here. Notice, vulnerabilities like a SQL injection and cross-site scripting. So SQL injection is when they come to your website, they type SQL commands into a field that you have where you can type data in, and they can execute basically SQL commands against your system. Cross-site scripting is when they type scripts into that uh, and then execute it against your website. This can do things like deface the website, expose sensitive data, corrupt data, bring down your websites, creating all kinds of DOS attacks, and so on. Now, first of all, you could be using SSL. I don't care what type of encryption you're using. If you have coded your website incorrectly, and I can just type anything in the boxes on your website, I don't care what encryption you're using, you're going to show me the data. So I can eliminate encryption right off the bat. Using the latest programming language and framework does not prevent SQL injections from cross-site scripting. It's good coding practices that does that. Scanning is not a preventive thing, right? In the context, which follow access is more important for preventing. Scanning is something you do afterwards to see if a prevention technique is working, so we can eliminate that. And of course, the answer here is going to be now input validation limits what you can actually type into the box. So for example, if a SQL command requires 20 characters and you limit it to just five, 
then you can't enter that, right? That command could never work. So that's how you do it with input validation. So remember, input validation, output encoding can solve things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting. All right, question 24. In a security answer response, which of the following is the most critical step immediately after detecting a security incident? Identify the scope and impact of the incident. Notify executive management. Uh, implemented containment and mitigation measures. Gather evidence for legal prosecution. So notice, most critical, <clears throat> immediately after. So this is a security incident. We do right away. Well, if you try to identify how big this thing is, that's going to take time. Notifying executive management and stakeholders, that's going to take time. This thing could be stealing data as we speak. Gathering evidence is something you're going to do way afterwards the incident. The best thing here to do is to, going to be to contain the incident. In your study guide, there is a list of what you should be doing during incident security, incident response. Make sure to know these steps for your exam. The moment an incident is detected, you have to contain the incident. You have to, for example, you don't want it to spread all over the network. And the longer you wait, the more data could be stolen or get corrupted in your business. Practice question 25. An application stores password for user authentication. Which of the following would be the best practice for storing these passwords? Encrypting the password using AES. Storing the password in a clear text with strict access control. Using salted hashes for password storage. Masking the password before storage. Now, this one plays on your level of knowledge. If you spend in your cryptographic chapters when you study this, or I go over in the class, I show you guys in the course, I'll show you exactly how hashes work. And I'll show you guys how I'm going to use a hash function to hash a particular password. So if you know that, you would have known that passwords are hashed. Now, we don't encrypt passwords with symmetric keys, as it wouldn't make sense that you would then need the key to decrypt it. You never store password in clear text. And Masking doesn't really do anything. Masking just doesn't show it on the screen, but it, the computer still sees it. Now, what exactly is a salted password? So a salted hash is basically when they add a bunch of characters to the actual password before they hash it. All right. So the password, the hashes are more complex, making it somewhat harder to reverse that hash. We'll cover salting in the course. If not, make sure to study it for your exam. Question 26, which of the following security controls is most effective in preventing unauthorized physical access to a data center? Biometric authentication, server level, C camera, uh, CCTV, surveillance cameras, man traps, access control, intrusion detection for data centers. Now, this one here is preventing unauthorized physical access. So first of all, we can eliminate. Notice it's preventing, stopping people from coming in. A camera doesn't stop anyone. All right, you have a camera in your house. It can detour, it can scare, but it's not a preventive control. A detection system is basically like a camera. It can detect people coming in, but it doesn't stop them from coming in. Biometric at the server level. This is at the server level. That wouldn't stop, you putting biometrics on your server, it doesn't stop people from coming into your data center, making a man trap. So what's a man trap? Man traps are double doors. They come in, it's two doors, people come in one of the door, they open one of the door, they come in, that door locks, and before the other door can open for them to get in, there's some kind of authentication mechanism. Sometimes they have to put a passcode in there, a thumbprint, or some kind of card reader, or a visual inspection by some kind of security guard to let them in making this the best preventive way for them to get in. This is the only control here that actually deals with a physical access into somewhere. Question 27. Which of the following is the most important reason for including security controls in the system development lifecycle? To meet regulatory compliance requirements, to ensure code and practice, secure code and practices are followed, to reduce the overall cost, to expedite the delivery of a new system. So by you including... Uh, good security control in your SDLC, which is the way how you're going to develop your software, it doesn't reduce the cost. It may actually increase the cost. Sometimes it may reduce it, so it's hard to determine that. 
it doesn't expedite things. Security is known, security are known to slow things down and it's very subjective. Now comes two things. To meet regulatory compliance and ensure secure code and practice are followed. A lot of you guys may go with this option, but I'm thinking like a manager, I'm gonna go with compliance requirements. Now, I'm gonna tell you guys, you have to go with one over the other. See, so if you're doing one, you're not doing the other. Remember this mindset. Here's a quick thing. If you're doing to meet regulatory compliance, right, that's the only reason why you would do it. That's A. B is to ensure when I got good scoring, you could care less about the, the requirements. So which one would you go with? Would you go for just requirements or would you go to ensure secured coding practices are followed? That makes this the best answer. Here's why. Because if you go with A, then you're saying that if there is no regulations, you're not going to do it. If you go with B, you're saying, well, I don't care about any regulations. I include it in the SDLC to ensure code and practice are followed. Isn't that why you do this? And A results in B. The, why do they have it? If they put it into regulatory compliance, the whole the objective they're doing that is to get B. Remember something. As a CISSP, as a manager, you're not thinking at the middle. You're not thinking almost at the end. You're seeing the end goal. Like, why are we, why are we really doing this? Think like that, ace your test. All right, we did 27, 28. Make sure to know, this is, I can see automatically, CVE, Common Volume Exposure Database, CVSS, the score. Make sure you know for your exam. Let's get into it. Given the CVE 2023, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, with a CVS uh, version 3, base curve 9, which of the following is most likely true? So you have to know this for your exam. Don't go in there without knowing it. You don't have to know how to calculate the score. Just know what the score means. The vulnerability of the low severity imposing uh, minimal threat requires a complex condition. The vulnerabilities are critical and pose a significant. Yes, the vulnerability impact is primarily related to data confidentiality. Okay, answer here. If you know this one, it's pretty easy and straightforward. You know that the CVSS scores go from 0 to 10. And generally, if something is 10, it's going to be something that is, this is 9.8. It's something that's easy to do, easy to exploit, creates massive harm against the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That C is the, is the correct answer here. This is not a low score. It does not require a complex. Remember, if it's a complex condition, the CVSS score reduces significantly. The impact is related to, even if it's related to confidentiality and doesn't affect integrity or, or availability, the score does get reduced, so it doesn't do that. Make sure to understand your CVSS score before going in for your exam. As a security personnel, you should also know your CVSS score. So when you see it on a security bulletin, you know what it means. In the course, we'll go through how to, how, how to compute it. I'll show you guys a calculator on that. Which of the following security controls is most effective when preventing unauthorized access to sensitive data stored on a mobile device that may be lost or stolen? Strong encryption, regular, uh, regularly updating device firmware, implementing device authentication or storing data in a secure cloud environment. Now, right off the bat, I can tell you guys that this question has caused my students a lot of heartache. Some people have disagreed with the answer, and I'll tell you how I got to the correct answer. So first thing up, you got to eliminate one choice. Notice unauthorized access to sensitive data stored on the device. So you telling it to store it in the cloud does not answer the particular question. So eliminate that. Now, the other one I'll eliminate is regularly updating device firmware. Why? Because even the, it can have the best firmware out there, but if the firmware itself or the device itself is not secured, you just keep updating things in an insecure device. Now, this is where it gets people. Authentication or encryption. So here's what I'll tell you guys. The way to get this answer is, if you have your phone, you have my phone with me? Yes, I have my phone. So if I have my phone, if you have one, you're not going to have the other. Remember that. If you have one, you're not going to have the other. That's how you have to think of this. So would you guys, I'm going to tell you guys, you guys are going to have amazing biometric authentication. No one can break, but the data is not encrypted. Or I'm going to tell you guys the data is encrypted, but there's no authentication on it. Now you're probably saying, well, if they, if they can just get in, can they see it? Yes, that's true. But you got to choose one. All right. Now, 
It says biometrics authentication. It doesn't say something like password authentication. So when data is stolen, when a device is stolen, somebody finds it, all right, even if they can't get in or get out, what would you want? The best thing here would be to encrypt the data. If the data is encrypted, it doesn't matter if they steal the device. Because remember, how do you bypass authentication if you can't get in? You just take out the drive, mount the drive to a different machine, and you can see all the data. So that you know that would be the option. If this thing is still falls into the wrong hands, it's still the data is unreadable unless they get to the encryption keys, making A the best answer. 30. Which of the following security principles emphasizes that security mechanisms should not rely on the secrecy of design or implementation? Least privilege, defense in depth, open design, separation of duties. Best answer here, guys, is going to be an open design. Here's why. It's a pretty straightforward question. Least privileges is when people don't have much power on the network. They're not admins or regular users. Defense in depth is utilizing multiple controls to keep things secure. Having a firewall, an IDS system, antivirus is a form of defense in depth. Separation of duties is one person can't perform all duties on a system to bypass controls and commit fraud. So open design, such as Linux, which means the source code is available for anyone to see. This one here, there's no, there's no secrecy of how the system is designed, how the system is implemented. There's no secrecy on the source code of Linux. There's secrecy on the source code of Windows, though, because that's called a closed design or closed source versus open source type systems. Make sure to know the difference for your test. 31. Which of the following is the most critical aspect of design, of privacy by design? Notice term for your exam. Encrypting sensitive data at risk and in transit. Appointing a data protection officer. Involving privacy expert for the, from the inception of the project. Regular, regularly updating uh, the organization privacy policy. So notice a critical aspect. Privacy by design is what? It's when you design application from the very beginning to secure private data, PII, person identifiable, PHI, personal health information. So encrypting the data at rest and in transit is good. I like that answer. Appointing the data protection officer who's going to be in charge and oversee it. I like that answer. Involving privacy experts from the very beginning. So this thing is designed with privacy Wait a minute, that sounds like the uh, best answer. And regularly updating, it's good to update the policy, but it's not going to be to get this out there. It's to make sure that you follow certain compliance. I'm going to eliminate that answer. I'm going to also eliminate encrypting sensitive data, although that's an important one. I think the most important thing is from the very beginning of your, your steps to design by privacy, having good private, having good privacy by design is to bring the right people involved and design the program correctly. This is the most critical step. So some people will say, okay, Andrew, how do you, you know, I'm doing a real exam. You know, how do I know I'm going to get this one right? Or how do I get this one right? Say to yourself, if I can only do one thing, right? You know, which one here, if you do it right, is going to lead to the others. Which one here? This one here is going to make sure that the, we got to get everything here done. You got to get a data protection data protection officer if you follow GDPR. You got to update your organization policy. You got to encrypt your data. But which one of these choices is now going to, if I do this, is going to lead me into the others? Well, if you get the right people involved, it's going to ensure that you get the right data. If you do this right, you're going to have the right data protection officer. If you do this right, you're going to update it. So you get this one correct, part of the mindset. Question 32, when assessing the security of industrial control or ICS systems, what is the primary focus of a red team engagement? So what's ICS? Industrial control, control systems are things like water, power, uh, supply system, gas supply system, big industrial systems. Identifying vulnerabilities, conducting penetration testing, simulating realistic attacks. Auditing compliance with industry standards. So, first of all, you got to understand red team and blue team, okay, to, to get this one correct. So, first of all, red team doesn't really audit for compliance and standards. They're generally within your business. 
identifying vulnerabilities in the infrastructure, okay, conducting the penetration testing, okay, simulating realistic attack. This is going to be the best answer. Why is that? Because a red team does do penetration testing. A red team does do, by them doing that, they are going to be identifying and exploiting vulnerabilities. So red team aims to identify vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the system, and then they go about to exploit it to see what happens. So if you're thinking, well, A and B is correct, yeah, it is correct. But C includes A and B, making C the best answer on this one. 33. When verifying a digital signature, which of the following steps is the most critical for ensuring the signature's authenticity? Decrypting a message using the public key. Verifying the digital certificate of the sender. Checking the timestamp of the signature. Comparing the hash value of the received data with the decrypted hash value in the signature. Now, a couple of things here. You have to understand how a digital signature works. So a digital signature basically takes a message, hashes the message and to produce a cryptographic hash, and then encrypts the hash with the sender's private key. With the sender's private key. That's a digital signature. So what's a digital signature? It's basically an encrypted hash of the message with the sender's private key. When you receive it for you to verify the hash, you then take the message and you hash it, and then you decode the signature that was sent to you from the sender with the sender's public key. You never get the sender's private key. And if the two hashes matches, that means that it had to come from that guy, from the sender, because you're using his public key, and the message was never changed. Why? Because the hashes match. If the, mess if the, mess if the hashes didn't match, a couple of things would have tell you. Either the message was changed or you're using the wrong key. It means it never came from that guy. Digital signatures for your exam, remember, it does a couple of things. It does non-repudiation, integrity, all right? So non-repudiation, the guy can't deny it came from him because you're using his public key. So if you know this information, this one here is pretty easy because you notice it doesn't really check for timestamps. Verifying the certificate doesn't actually mean it came from that person. Right, you you do know you can check the certificate actually came, but remember if the hash was if the message changed, you wouldn't really know. Decrypting the message using the public key, you don't decrypt the message. You see, digital signatures does not encrypt the data. In fact, digital signatures doesn't provide confidentiality. So if you did say that one, incorrect. What I just explained to you was the make sure you know the process and purpose of a digital signature. Question 34. What is the most important what is the most critical factor to consider when selecting a vendor in the context of information security? Vendor reputation, geographic location, data classification, and business continuity. So you're thinking security. All right. When you're thinking in security, you're thinking, okay, we're gonna go out, we're gonna select a vendor, maybe to store data, process data, something like that. You know, why are you using this particular vendor? Now, I do like almost all the answers here is, is correct. They're all important. They're things to consider, such as the reputation of that vendor, where they're located, the type of data we're going to store with them, and business continuity of that vendor. Now, here's the thing. There's one answer here that holds all the other answer. There's one answer here that affects all the other answer. And that answer is going to be data classification. And I want you guys to know this one because data classification will affect everything about the data, where it's stored, who has access to it, how they can access it, what type of cloud systems it can be used on, what type of hard drive or, or physical medium that it can be stored on. Where is it going to be stored? In a vault, in a file, in a locked cabinet? Where can this data be stored? So data classification is a good answer throughout your exam. If you ever see it as a choice on the exam, I want you guys to pay attention to it because you know why? It's probably going to be one of the better answers that are out there. So data classification is definitely good because data classification may dictate what type of reputation the person must have. It may dictate where this person is located may dictate what type of continuity policies that that person has in place, making this the best answer. Question 35. 
What is the primary goal of security governance framework? Compliance with industry standards, mitigating all risk to zero, maximizing share of the profits, aligning security with business objectives. So the primary goal, all right, what exactly is the primary? And this one in particular is security governance framework, and particularly security governance. So security governance is the management of all security activities to accomplish basically the organization objectives. And you can see the answer here. So is it compliance with industry standard? I like that. You're never going to mitigate all risk to zero, as that is practically impossible. Maximize shareholders' profit. I do like that answer. Align in security with business objectives. I like this answer. So now we bring it, we brought it down to three. Now, compliance with industry standards. This is a good answer, but it's not the best answer. And the reason for that is because you're saying that the goal of this is just so if there was no industry standard, you wouldn't have this. No, not the good one. Maximize shareholders' profit and aligning with business objectives. So maximizing shareholders' profit is something that is of corporate governance framework, not just the security governance framework. The security governance framework is basically to keep the security function aligned with business objectives. That's going to lead to maximizing shareholders' profit, but it's not the only component. To maximize shareholders' profit, you're going to have good corporate governance, and that's and remember, security governance, or IS, information technology governance, or information system governance is a subset of corporate governance. We learned that in domain one. Making D here the best answer. Practice question 36, which of the following is best which, which of the following best represents the concept of due care and security governance? So this one here, you have to have, just know, quick definition. Implement the controls to prevent all security incidents. Okay. Exercise and reasonable security measures protect the asset. Okay. Conducting security audits. Uh, assigning security responsibility solely to the IT department. Now, this particular one is a straightforward definition. If you knew the definition, you should have gotten this one correct, as this is the definition of due care. Due care is when you do what's called reasonable security practices in order to secure an asset. It's like, what would a reasonable person have done to secure this machine? For example, a reasonable person updates their machine. A reasonable security guy keep backup of data. Implementing control, they do that. This is correct. Conducting uh, security audits, yeah, they do that. I don't know about this thing here that says assign it to slowly to the IT department, but you do assign it to the IT department. Don't forget, by exercising reasonable security measures, you're going to do A, you're going to do C, and you're going to do D. Some of the reasons why it would be eliminated D, this word solely, and the other one is A, to prevent all security. You can't really present, prevent all, you can try your best to prevent most. Be careful of this word all. Okay, question 37. In a multi-tier application architecture, which of the following layers is most, most vulnerable to injection attacks such as SQL injection and command injection? Presentation, application, data link, or transport? Now, I included this because every single one of the CISSP candidate, or you included, will get an OSI question. Know what happens at the layers. Know what devices happens there because they may ask for attacks against devices and more importantly know what attacks can happen at each layer know for example like where a ddos may happen such as a ping flood where would that take place in this particular one we're looking at a sql injection so if you know sql injections and, and command injections you pretty much know that this was an application layer attack and this is not something that is uh, very difficult to understand because if you understand what's happening at the different layers, it's not that difficult. For example, the presentation deals with really formatting of the data, not so much so of typing in and seeing the data and interacting with the application. The data link layer, this is all the way at the bottom of the OSI model. This is going to be with the passing of frames. This concerns itself more with things like passing frames, like using a MAC address. This is where switches work. So it's not really with the application. The transport layer deals with when data arrives at your machine, things such as knowing the particular port number, error check and error recovery, and like connection-oriented connections. It's not really going to deal so much so with the application itself. The best answer here is going to be the presentation layer. Once again, make sure you know your OSI, know it inside out, know what happens at each layer, know what devices operates where, and of course, know the different attacks. In the course, we have a great outline on that. 
Question 38, which of the following security assessment methods is most suitable for evaluating the security posture of an application source code? So you have to evaluate basically the security, like how secure the security posture or the source code. So which one here looks at the source code? Well, network scanning is not going to actually look at the source code. Social engineering is talking with people. You should be limited to those two. Now comes which one, which one of these here looks at more of the source code, vulnerability scanning or statics? If you use something like the Nexus scanner, it's not going to scan the source code. It's going to scan the outer of the application or the entire compiled, the compiled application. The only thing here that actually looks at the source code of an application is static analysis, in which case it basically reads the code to see if there's any vulnerability in the code. Make sure you know things for your exam, things like dynamic static testing uh, for your exam. Question number 39. Almost all of you guys will get questions on GDPR. Know it well for your test. Which of the following best captures the primary intent of GDPR? Ensuring EU citizens can shop online securely. Protecting the fundamental right to privacy, to data privacy of EU citizens. Uh, EU residents encouraging international business to operate within the EU, streamlining and updating legacy uh, EU privacy. So first of all, if you know what GDPR is, GDPR is, is a European, basically it's a data standard, or I should say um, protection. And what this does is that it looks at the data privacy, and the answer is B, of EU citizens. It basically tells organizations that if you store EU data, the you have to secure it and you have to give the users control back of their data. If you sell it, you have to let them know. If you're going to, uh, if you go to a website and you have like tracking cookies on, you have to let them know. For your exam, know what the GDPR is. I need you guys to know things like the data protection officer. That's an important term and a role. Make sure you study that for your exam. In the course, we'll give them much more things and different laws you should be familiar with. All right. Here is a question that's a hit and miss that some people get, some people don't, but you should know the formulas to calculate. In a symmetric, in a, in a symmetric key network of 100 nodes, where each, uh, where each node securely communicates with every other node using a unique key, how many symmetric keys are needed? So this one, I put a big number, but on the exam, you're going to have to just know this formula. It's n times n minus one divided by two. So I'm going to show you guys a, a quick, easy example of this. So let's say you have three users on a network. Uh, you have Bob, Mary, and Jane, all right? Three people. Now, for these people to communicate securely using a unique key. Now, unique means different key. So you would have a key between Bob and Mary. So when they communicate, Jane can't see. Between Bob and Jane, so when they're communicating, Mary can't see. And between Mary and Jane, so when they communicate, Bob can't see. So one, two, three keys. If Peter joined the mix, Peter needs a unique key with Bob, with Jane, and for Mary, that means six keys, three more were added. So if you have four people, just do the math. Four minus, to put four, four minus one is three. Three times four is 12, divided by two is six. So if you put in the number 100, and you do the formula, you get 50-50 on this. Note a calculation for your exam. It's one of the few formulas you need to know. There are some formulas in risk management that I tell students to know. They're hit and miss when you get them, but so is this one. Okay, next question. When assessing the risk to PHI in a cloud environment, which of the following should be of primary concern? Location of the data center, type of encryption used in the data storage, SLA uh, uptime guarantee by the cloud provider, data access and control agreements with the provider. Okay, so this one here, good set of things. If I was you, I'm looking at this going, man, all these are good. Yeah, because, you know, if the data center is stored in, in, in Russia, you probably don't want that. The type of encryption, yeah, they use weak encryption. You don't want that. SLA uptimes, notice this is PHI should be a primary concern. Although I would be a concern with the uptime, not so much. I'm thinking more of like, losing the data to hackers, not just it going down. Data access and control agreements with the provider. I think I would need that because we need to make sure the provider has good in there. Now, you got to apply some of the techniques I've taught you so far. If you did it, you probably got the answer already because the answer here is the most generic answer. 
You see, location of the data center is important because the data center, again, is in China or Russia. You don't want that data center to be in a in a country where, you know what, maybe the government can control that or take control of it or is an adversary of us in the United States. Type of encryption using the data storage. You probably, you know, you're worried about that because if they use DES, you don't want that. You want them to use AES encryption. When you come down to, to choices where you're like, man, these two are 100% right, then go with the one that includes both because they'd, the agreement can specify where the data should be located. The agreement can specify the type of encryption that should be there. So if you would apply the right uh, technique, should have got this one right. 42. Why is data remnants considered a security concern? It increases the storage costs. It can lead to the data being corrupt. Residual data might be recoverable after uh, deletion of this or, or this one. It results in slow data access. P2, data remnants is a hot topic. Data remnants, if you know the definition here, it's a pretty easy question. Data remnants is when you take out a hard drive, you delete the data off of it, and the data is not all deleted or or some, most of it or some of it is recoverable. So that is definitely C. An increase to the storage cost. It doesn't increase storage costs because you're getting rid of storage. It can lead to the data being corrupt. It has nothing to do with data corruption. It's more about data being recoverable. It results in slow data access. When your data remnants and you erase the disk, there's nothing about accessing data. Now, you're going to worry about data remnants and the security concern because if you take out a hard drive that has a lot of data on it, you put that drive in the garbage, that data might still be accessible. And people can then take that and recover data and basically steal your data or get your data from your business. Best thing to do are to do things like sanitize the media, giant magnet across it, or shred the drive so the data is unrecoverable. Question number 43, a security analyst observes multiple unauthorized data extraction attempts from a database server. Upon investigation, all extraction attempts have been tracked back to a single user account. Which of the following should be the analyst to immediate action? Delete the user account. Notify the user. Isolate or disable the account and initiate an incident response. Implement a stricter access control in database. So, I mentioned earlier in this video when you're doing when you find when you're doing security incident response, you have to follow the steps. So right now, you notice this upon all attempts have been tried. So you have done, you know the attack, you know the attack is happening. Nobody have to have to contain it. But you have to stop it. How do you stop this account from this happening right away? Choose the best answer. Deleting the user account, you don't delete anything, because deleting user accounts can cause data to be lost. You don't call the user and tell the user what you're doing right away. The best thing here is to disable this account. Implementing stricter access control, this person already has it. You need to disable and stop it because stricter access control in the database server, uh, maybe he has access to him due to, to another server. Best answer here is definitely to isolate, disable it. So those steps that you learn about in the course, your security incident response steps, make sure to follow them even if you... The question doesn't ask, like, you know, what step to do next, because this is a scenario-based question. Question number 44. Which of the following security assessment methods is most effective for identifying known vulnerabilities that are not disclosed publicly? Notice, most effective identifying unknown vulnerabilities that are not disclosed publicly. Vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, code review, Information, security, and event management. Okay, so this one here, I thought this one was pretty easy. A lot of my students have trouble with this one. Let's go through it. The keyword here is, is not publicly disclosed. And notice it's identifying unknown, things that haven't been found. If it's something that's unknown, a vulnerability scanner is not going to find it. The vulnerability scanner uses a database of known vulnerabilities. Information, the SIEM systems, this just correlates events. This doesn't really, it's not going to help you detect things. And for and it's not going to help you go out to detect. And if it does have a detection engine on it, it has to be known. Code review and penetration testing. So this is where this one becomes difficult. If you're reviewing codes or doing a penetration test, 
the best thing here I'm going to tell you guys is a penetration test. And here's why. You see, a penetration test, ethical hacking, one of the courses I teach is CEH, by the way. This here finds all kinds of vulnerabilities within a system. A pen tester will try all different vulnerabilities and try to exploit those vulnerabilities, look for new vulnerabilities to find. A code review is generally done by programmers. Code reviews, they're good, but that's done more at the application level. And it's mostly going to look for knowing, for example, static analysis. It's going to look for knowing vulnerabilities in certain codes versus a pen test is the best of these answers. Question 45, in the context of forensics investigation, which of the following best describe the primary purpose of maintaining a chain of custody? So what's a chain of custody? It's a, basically, it's a document that tracks evidence from the moment you gather to giving it back. So that whole uh, evidence life cycle from collection of the evidence, storing it, analyzing it, presenting it, returning it. Now, it'll say who took it, when they took it, where they... Who took it, when they took it, how they took it, where they stored it, who had access to it, when did they access it, what did they do with it. Basically, it is a document showing me every single thing documented that has happened to this evidence. It ensures evidence is properly cataloged, not necessarily. To demonstrate integrity, yes it does, because it looks to how the evidence was handled and if it was handled correctly. To ensure only authorized, it doesn't do that, it just shows how the evidence was handled. To protect it, no, it doesn't really protect anything. It does, evidence protection is like storing it in an encrypted vault, not using the chain of custody. So the chain of custody is to demonstrate the integrity of it. Question number 46, which of the following provides the best assurance of an application security posture over time? Conduct annual pen tests, implement strict password policy, continuous integrations with security testing, Quarterly vulnerability assessment. I thought this one was easy. Hopefully you guys got it. Notice best assurance. And this is going to be done over time. There's a couple of things here. Penetration tests just doesn't have to be done annually. Okay, they could be done annually. They could be done quarterly or as needed. Stricter password policies. Well, passwords are good, but it says over time. I'm not sure how password policies affects over time. Quarterly, a vulnerability test, for example, like the PCI, is done depending on how much swipes you have or how many cards you do. So, not necessarily quarterly. See, these are put in hardcore timestamps on these things. So, the best thing here, guys, is continuous integration. This one, the word best assurance, and especially over time, is you have to go with the word continuous. Security is not a quarterly thing. It's not an annual thing. It is a continuous thing. Question number 47. An organization wants to make sure its sensitive data is unreadable if it's intercepted during transmission. Which principle is the organization most concerned about? So hopefully you guys, this is the beginning. This is the first chapter you're going to read in your book. This is going to be about the CIA. All right. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You, if you intercept data, you can't access the data. Best answer here, guys, is going to be C. This is basically one of the definitions here. Only authorized individual can access or read the particular data. That's the, basically the definition of confidentiality. Integrity is no, all, no unauthorized modification or no unintentional modification. Availability is the uptime of the day. Now repudiation is a subject cannot deny that an event has taken place. Question number 48. In the context of mobile application development, ensuring that application components are not exposed to other apps on the same device Refers to, all right, you guys need to know this one for your exam. You need to know the term. Is it data in transit? Data in transit is when data is moving from one location to the other. They're looking at other apps on the same device, so it's not going to be this. This is more for like network, and this is like SSL would do this, SSH. Code, obfuscation is basically hiding or hiding the source code to so make it harder for people to read it. Um, Data at rest, this encrypts the data. This is data not being exposed of other apps on the same device. The best thing here is a sandbox. So on mobile devices, we have application sandbox. So sandbox, basically, it restricts the memory space so only that app can operate there. That way, other apps can't, in, can't bleed over or get over to that memory space and steal the app's data.
It's one of the things, because of application sandbox, and it's one of the things that makes mobile app, mobile devices pretty secure. Question number 49, we're getting down to the end here. Which of the following is the most critical factor for ensuring the success of the security governance program? Advanced technology, comprehensive security policies, strong executive support, and experienced security staff. Now, if you have been studying CISP, you should notice one right off the bat. It is a common CISSP question, in which case the most important part of any security program is, of course, going to be senior management support. Senior management support. If you don't have senior management support, you will not have comprehensive policies because remember, it comes from, it comes from management. You will not have experienced security staff as they wouldn't hire. You wouldn't have advanced technology or great technology because they wouldn't care to, to implement it. Once senior management supports, everything starts to fall into place. You get the right budget. You get the right people. You get the right technology. You get the right standards to follow. You get the right guidelines and procedures and all that great stuff. Question number 50. In a token, in a tokenization, in a token, basically in a token system, uh, what primarily distinguishes a token from the original sensitive data it represents? Now, the token is always longer than original data. The token contains a cryptic segment of the data. The token on its own has no meaningful value or information. The token must be reversible to the original data without any additional information. So you guys should know tokenization. Tokens are used a lot. You go to PayPal, you check out, you're using a token. Uh, anyway, you go to Best Buy, you check out with PayPal, you're using a token. Token is basically a representation of sensitive data. The token by itself has no meaningful value. If you steal the token, uh, you can't get back the data. So a token is used to represent a block of data. For example, a token can be used to represent a particular credit card. And every time you use this token, it builds your credit card. But if somebody ever steals your token, you can never get back your credit card. So that's what a token is for. This one is more of a data definition question. All right, I said I got 50 questions. I got one more for you, just to throw in a bonus in here. I wanted to include this one because some people, a lot of people are getting questions on DevSecureOps, Agile, continuous uh, deployment, uh, continuous integration, CIDI. Let's see what this question is. Just make sure you study these topics for your exam. In a DevSecureOps environment, where is the responsibility for the for security, primarily lie in the context of continuous integration, continuous deployment versus agile. Solely with the security team in CIDI uh, and with developers in agile, equally distributed across. Primarily with developers in CIDI and equally across all the teams in agile. Solely within the operations team in CIDI and with the security team in agile. Okay, Dev Secure Ops. So. DevOps is continuous deployment, continuous integration, keep pushing out software, keep updating software. Agile is the development of software generally done in increments or in iteration, things like following Scrum, extreme programming, and so on. If you guys know me, you know I teach a lot of project management. But anyhow, this question, I did find it to be pretty easy because it follows an old principle. Security lies in whose hand? Security lies... I mean, everyone's hand. B, security is not something that lies in the hands of just developers. Security doesn't lie in the hands of just implementers or installers. Security is basically everyone's responsibility, right? That's one of the first things you're going to learn about security. Security is not just one person's job. It's everybody's job. Everybody has to do their job because if there's a one break in security, the entire thing breaks. All right, guys, that concluded... My 50 questions, if you found value in this video, give it a like, subscribe to our channel. We'll do a lot more videos. If you guys want me to do more of these kinds of videos to help you pass your exam, let me know. I'll be happy to. It took me a while to make this. It did take me a while um, to make these questions, uh, to do it. Hopefully, this helps you out. I did this a lot for my own students. They have asked me to review these questions quite a lot. So I said, let me make a video and share it with everyone else. If you are studying for your CISSP, and um, you want to join me in a class, I'd be greatly appreciated. Here's what I tell people, guys. Studying for the CISSP is not where you take it. If you go and you spend $4,000, $10,000, $8,000 at some of these crazy companies that are charging crazy money, 
You know, it's not where you take it. It's who's teaching it that matters. I've been teaching this a long time. So I'm going to tell you guys, hey, join me in a class. Uh, me and my colleagues here, I did all the training videos for the CISSP here at TIA. So when you sign up for a class, you'll get my entire boot camp as a, uh, a video course. And I may even be your boot camp instructor. So guys, if you found value, once again, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next video.